Yeah. And we're going to wait for that to go away. Vroom. I am kind of curious how much these will pick up that noise in the background. That'll be... For future editing purposes, Dryson, there's a, a UTV driving right over there, right yeah. now. Approximately 59 feet away. Yes, yeah, so we need to have a noise floor for this so we can... <laughs> She's just going to start doing it <laughs> loops. Come back up, you're going to back down there. Like, stop! We're trying to shoot video. Get out of here. Welcome to Frame One. I'm Dryson, and today I'm sitting down with Austin Saylor. You are a freelancer, but you're moving kind of into the coaching and helping other freelancers kind of learn how to make money and, and grow their own freelance businesses, correct? That's correct. Now, I'm going to be honest. I haven't done my traditional super deep dive on you here, uh, so I kind of want to lean on you for your information and just your, your background. Yeah. Tell me a bit about yourself. Yeah, so yeah, I'm a 2D freelance motion designer. Um, After Effects is my jam, and I got a, my background is design got into video and figured out I can mesh those together. They go together kind of nice. They do. And I didn't know motion design was really a thing until I found like School of Motion. And that just like fueled the, the drive to go in this new direction. Went freelance eight years ago and really loved the freelancing, but I also loved getting into just teaching some stuff. It, it started with like tutorials. Yeah. And then I taught a course on how to do lettering animation. So I was teaching lettering artists how to do animation basically with After Effects. Absolutely. And that was a blast. And uh, my, I guess this is the kind of a full story, but. Please do, yeah. Um, the freelance was great. Well, it was good. <laughs> um, it was good. I was enjoying it. And I was like free from the corporate job that I had. And so I was excited, but I kept hitting the ceiling of like the creative projects and the money. It was all like sparse and I kept hitting the ceiling of I'm hit, making like 70,000 and 80,000, 90,000 and then back down to 80. Yeah. And, yeah. and I, I was like, I feel like I can reach higher. And especially with coaching or with some teaching as well, I thought that was my path towards, um, kind of more financial, a bigger income, but I found that I was getting spread so thin that I couldn't make any traction on any one particular endeavor. And so it was 2021 when I decided that I'm going to cut out all teaching. I know how to make money with freelance. So I'm going to double down on that and see if I can't double my income. And so I set a, set out to make 200K. Project 200. That, yep, yep. Project yep. 200K. And was very publicly open about my progress. Uh, month one, I made $0. Solid start. <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, you know, if I, get, if I hit 200K and I had zero at the beginning, it's a good story. And I had talked to a bunch of people who were very open and honest with me about their journey towards making more money. So when I announced it, uh, I had a whole bunch of people come in and say, like, privately, hey, I've made 200K. It can be done. So there were at least eight people that said, like, yeah, you can do it. I've either made 200 or close. And yeah. a couple of people had made double that. And so I was like, okay, it's possible. I've never seen it happen, so I'm glad that I'm doing this publicly so others can kind of see. And if I hit it, then it's awesome. If I don't, then... You've got a hell of a story I've, to tell. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so long story short, I did it. And... Uh, um kind of came through at the last half of the year, pick, things picked up a ton, and it was awesome. So even even before Project 200K, uh, I noticed that you also did like leather work as well, like we're going way back. Yeah. So I kind of had this like sense that, hey, maybe he's kind of in that design, creative, gonna be, you know, tying it through multiple meetings, that kind of stuff. Um, so let's just kind of talk about that for a second, because that's kind of a fun part of your history that yeah. I think people that are motion designers sometimes have a fun little outside the digital world tie. Yeah, that started as a, two things one it was it was the times i was a designer but i was interested in video yeah and i saw this video on vimeo of a very creative project where someone shot a bunch of footage of these old leather makers like shoemakers and they cut together a cool video making like using the sounds from the leather like oh, cool. and they made the whole song out of the, the sounds sound effects of the making leather so i was like amazed by the video production quality and the the like quality of the products and yeah. I was like oh and so I kind of went down both routes so I was like video and leather and found a friend who was making leather bags and he taught me the ropes of like how to do different stitches and what kind of leather to get and so that took me down a whole path of a side project where I built uh, that's the original Full Harbor so my motion design company now is called Full Harbor oh, okay I didn't realize that but um my leather company was called Full Harbor and it wasn't like a company where I made 
all my money, but it was a side hustle. A side hustle. It was great for like branding, figuring out marketing, um, products, customer service, and fulfillment. Sales and this was, yards. yeah, so this was the idea of a business. It was all before I went freelance. So that gave me a ton of experience with customers um, before I had that experience. So I've got to ask, did that, did that branding change from the leather work to the, uh, the, the coaching side? The branding changed, but the, the name, since the leather business, I just let it die. <laughs> um, I was like, oh, the, the name is just so great. My last name is Sailor. Uh, harbor is a place of business, and when the harbor is full, that means business is good. It's like all these so like perfect it's, touch points. Yeah, I like I gotta use it. I gotta so I took it. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. So the point of Frame One is to really explore your emotional journey, going from that freelance world, moving up, and just kind of as your career kicked off. And I think what I really want to talk to you is is the Project Two Hundred is, is really cool. The fact that you're you were willing to be open, transparent, and honest. And I think in just any industry, freelance, motion design doesn't matter. All of them. Um, Money's a scary thing to talk about. Like people don't want to be, they're afraid of being, oh, what if I'm failing? What if I'm, I don't want to be till you only made $30 last year, you know? Yeah. It was hopefully not that low, but like 30 grand. And so the fact that you were willing to make that, that leap and say, hey, yes, I'm going to document it. Month one, I made $0. <laughs> talk to me about how initially when that project kicked off and you hit that first milestone of zero, what was going through your mind? Um. Yeah, hitting zero on the first month and knowing that I said I was going to be transparent. I think I first had that gut like, oh, maybe I should just let this one die. <laughs> I'm just not going to talk about this anymore. How many people have seen it at that point? Right. Like, well, I've done this in the past where I've like, big announcement, and then I don't follow through. <laughs> right. Big announcement. I'm starting a podcast. I don't follow through. I've done that before. So like, I'm comfortable with cutting, like killing projects if I need to. Yeah. And this one, I just felt something in my gut that was like, no, stick with it. Be honest, be transparent. That's okay. Failure in any moment is just a moment in time. Yep. And yep. like you cannot succeed without failing. So this is just the first part that feels like a failure. And like I'm all when I when I do these things and write my blog posts and a newsletter and tweets and whatnot, I'm doing that so that other people can either see themselves in my journey and when they hit that point, because everybody's gonna hit that really bad month. Right, right. And feel like I'm not gonna make it. So it was cool to be like, okay, I'm pretty sure I'm going to make it. I'm confident that I have a strategy that will get me there. And it's just a really bumpy start. Right, right. And other people will get, will see themselves in that and be encouraged. And when, very much to relate to it, I'm sure, as well. Yeah. So month two rolls around. How did that go? Uh, I got a project yes. <laughs> <laughs> at the end of the month. And that was awesome. Um, it was It was exciting to like get things rolling. And I was getting a lot more requests coming in. So I was like, okay, something's going to start ticking up upward and so that was that was like okay the fruits of my labor january was outreach and networking yep. like all the time yep and you, you cannot expect outreach and networking to generate work that month it's like a month's cycle sometimes years cycle you never know when your availability your skill set and the client project is going to line up yep and so yeah the outreach is don't you know you got to dig the well before you're thirsty or plant the seed before you harvest. Any good analogy like that is is always the case with the outreach and networking. Absolutely, and I know you're kind of diving a, a more into coaching as well and helping other freelancers achieve these dreams. Is there a price for that that coaching model that you're you're doing right now? Yeah. Okay, so I don't want to dive too deep into like giving away all the information for free because you know oh, we don't want to do that. I I'm an open book. Oh, to you me, you want to do that? Tell me all the secrets of your course so I can make. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> well, I mean, honestly, like the material that I'm teaching, I think it. it, it it helps students follow it in a, a nice clean process Okay. and they have a, there's a curriculum and they're watching the stuff and we're doing that. The coaching is a huge part, but then the accountability to do the stuff. I've always said that buying a course is not an investment in your career, doing the work in the course is Absolutely. And so I'm building my program in a way that is, keeps people accountable to doing the stuff that's hard, yep. which is going and finding clients that you want to reach out to doing the networking, posting on social media consistently. And so the implementation is more of what they're buying. It's, it's, it's content and training, but so much of it is like the accountability to get the stuff done. Gotcha. Gotcha. I want to dive more into that down the road here later, but for now, let's kind of focus on the, the growth and the path of project 200 K. And the reason I want to make sure I say that is because my ADHD will brain will just run down the <laughs> rabbit hole right now. <laughs> um, so sticking to project 200 K yep. first month, got a project and things are starting to pick up with traction. How were you documenting your pro your project or your progress, and what were you releasing to to the the world to let them know what was going on? Yeah, I was I was keeping track of like how many people I was reaching out to, 
um, the projects that I was getting, how much I was getting for those projects. And, uh, yeah, every, I wasn't super consistent with, I wanted to do like a monthly update and I did that yeah. for a little bit and then I got busy with work and I'm like, at some point I remember a tweet going out where I was like, well, I haven't talked much about this because I'm doing the work to make the money. Yep. Um, yep. the projects have come in and I don't have as much time to create content describing the work that I'm doing. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, it was, a. uh, uh basically documenting what I was doing, what was working, what didn't seem to be working. And some of that was like, um, some of the outreach I wasn't getting traction on, uh, networking was a huge piece for me. Yeah. Um, I've been building relationships, relationships in the, in the industry for uh, six years at that point. Yeah. And so, I mean, outreach to clients is your, is a form of networking. It's, you know, I want to introduce myself. Um, but I had already introduced myself to so many people that it just became a, a form of, reaching out again and saying, Hey, I'm available for freelance Just checking in almost because also for me, I had been teaching a lot and a lot of my content was about like, here's a tutorial. Here's how to do this yeah. in after effects. So not everybody knew that I was freelancing that maybe you're just teaching. And so I needed to kind of not rebrand myself, but that's part of why I called it project 200 K. I wanted to talk about what I was doing. And I think that's part of any good like content strategy is to, to let the people that could hire you know what you're that you're doing. available, what you're doing. And um, to get them emotionally involved, which uh, to me, I think Project 200K really hit that nice sweet spot of like, yeah. ooh, yeah, I want to know <laughs> for anybody well, who's it's super like intriguing. Like, I've never made 200K in a year. And I'm like, I, tell me more. I'm very right. intrigued. So, yeah, very, very like like in your face, grabs your attention. Let's talk a little bit about those those building those relationships. You said you did a lot of networking ahead of time. Was that mainly through like cold emails? Was that through going to conferences? Yes. Uh, Twitter, conferences, cold emails. Um Zoom calls back then it was Skype I think before the pandemic <laughs> had, like right. a lot of Skype calls, <laughs> um, but yeah I've, I've as a very shy person it shocks my parents that I'm like I like coming to conferences and talking with people I don't know yeah and I it's my absolute favorite thing and so but yeah that's also one of my things that I like to tell people is that I'm I'm shy I'm introverted so like I've gone and taken naps in my cabin a couple times here already. Cause I need to recharge. Absolutely. But I also want to make really good connections with real people. And in person is the strongest way to make that kind of connection. Something like Camp MoGraph, where we are right now. Yep. Yep. Um, there's nothing like the, the in person. Perfect. And I love um, it. so it, there's so many different ways to connect with people, whether that's just DMing somebody and saying like, man, I love that piece that you made to me. There's like the hierarchy of in person video chat, uh, maybe like text messages yeah, and DMS and then like comments and likes and follows. Like those are kind of the hierarchy of how deep is your connection. Yeah. And, um, you don't want to just jump into the deepest end necessarily right away. Sometimes there, you, you need to warm, warm up. up a little bit. Yeah. And even if it's a peer, like you don't want to necessarily like, well, most of the peers in the motion design the industry are cool with like, if you're in the same town, let's grab coffee. Right. Um, when you're working on a national basis, it's a little harder to be like, hey, right. you want to get up at, you know, five and go hang out and grab a coffee or. Yeah. yeah. That's fair. Yeah. You'd mentioned Camp MoGraph, which is where we are right now. Uh, this is your very first Camp MoGraph ever. Yes. As I understand. What do you think so far? Oh, man, it's fantastic. It's such a different format from any other conference I've been to. I've been to a lot of creative conferences, and this one is pretty special. Um, the To be in the same, everyone's in the same space. There's no, like, going off to your hotel. And. The, the way there's workshops and the, I don't know, there's lots of mingling and hanging out and it's a longer space of time versus just one day do the conference one or two or days of conference. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, I'll definitely be coming back. <laughs> good deal. Good deal. I love to hear that. Uh, so moving back to project 200 K. Uh, so you started doing these connections and outreach ahead of time. And now the project kicks off, you start reaching out and just starting saying, Hey, I'm available. Things are going. If you want to do this, as the year progressed and you get closer and closer to that goal of, of 200, and as I understand that first year you actually went over mm -hmm. 200K, that moment you hit the, the money spot, you hit the jackpot of 200, talk to me about that, that emotion, <laughs> that feeling. Oh, man, it was so cool. And I had a feeling it was coming. Like I could see it in, in the writing. Like if this project lands, okay, that didn't do it. If this project comes in, that'll, that'll push it over 200. But, yeah, hitting that, the, the actual, I know that, I've earned 200K and getting into some, some weeds, I was counting it by invoices that I sent. Yeah. So like not just money that came in from a project in December, I wanted it to be 
work that I did in, in the year. Specifically in the time year. Frame. And it's just a detail. But if there was a point in my project where I'm like, as soon as I'm done with today, that is 200K earned. And it was just like a huge relief. And I was, I was really proud of myself for sticking with something for so long. Yeah. Um, I don't know if anybody else can uh, resonate with starting things and not finishing them. I've done that <laughs> so many times. I've had big goals. I've had personal projects. I've had any array of things that I've not followed through on. And this was, this was probably only the second time that I've had like a full year project that I've completed to yeah. completion. One of them was a year of push-ups where I did a hundred push-ups on average per day. And Swole. <laughs> I actually, I was like the best, the most in shape I've been. And that was like all the exercise I did was just push-ups, but I, I should probably try that. <laughs> yeah. It's not It's and it's easy. It's like easy. Once you get in the rhythm of it, it was, it was fun. But yeah, that was those two things. And they both happened in December. Uh, 2018 was the push-ups. 2021 was the, the 200 K, but like crossing that finish line of a year long project and it like seeing the result, like the result of the push ups was I feel fit. My shirts fit better. Yeah. Like I'm, I don't know, just the physical goodness that comes from dopamine hit. consistent workout yeah. is unreal. And, uh, I mean the financial impact of making 200 K is huge. I we moved to New York in the middle of, or at the beginning kind of, we had one really good month. Yeah. In the, sorry, I'm kind of getting, I'm going down a rabbit trail. We're good. We're good. But but, wherever this goes, we go. <laughs> yeah. So your month one, zero money. Uh, month two, maybe like three or 4,000. Month three was like 14, 15 K, which was probably close to the most I had ever made. Okay. Um, I was making on average like 8,000 a month, 8,800 yeah, maybe yeah. Um, before. And so we had that one good month and that's when we made the decision to move to New York City. Cause I was like, all right, I, I, I really believe that what I'm trying when and the, the path I'm taking is going to get us there to 200 K. And I know that New York city is going to like be crazy for cost of living. Yep. So there's a lot of going back and forth with my wife where I'm like, yes, I'm confident. And she's like, okay, let's do it. And then the next day I'd be like, we're making a mistake. <laughs> I don't know. Like, I don't think we should do this. <laughs> I feel like that's day to day of a freelancer's life in yeah. general. Like, <laughs> all right, I'm going to be my own boss. Oh my God, what am I doing? <laughs> yes. Um, so eventually we just made the decision like, yeah, I'm going to stick to it. And then um, we weren't moving for a couple of months. Yeah. So the, the next month, I think I made 36,000. Was that your, your biggest month? That was the biggest month. But it was also like some, a lot of projects overlapping and just late nights uh, one week where and this is the real honest truth yeah that i wrote a note to myself with a lot of expletives saying i hate this i don't like doing this yeah i i i hate motion design well let's talk about that a little <laughs> bit because that's kind of a big because to hit 200k is one thing so you did it that's awesome but at what cost yeah and so i i had made the commitment that i want to make 200k no matter the cost and my wife was all in on that like Hey, yeah. if you want to do this and I, uh, no, no, not, not, not exactly no matter the cost period. Right. But like, right. like it it's might, not worth getting divorced over. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> like that wasn't good. That was off the table. <laughs> um, but I was willing to work late nights. I was willing to do weekends. I was willing to hustle my ass off to get to that point yeah. and see, see if it's worth doing again. And that one week period or one or two weeks in the month of January, April or May. Okay. I'm bad at those months. Yeah, I'm like, I can't the live. They're fuzzy. So anyways, yeah, uh, it was like, I, I hate this so much. And I couldn't even see past, like, it will be over. I was like, literally in two days, this project will be done because it has to get delivered. And I still was like, this feels like it's going to be my life forever. And I can't stand it. You were just that burned out. Yeah. And um, so I took not necessarily some time off, but I took time away from stacking projects because yeah. I was working for like a studio, but then I also had another project that was kind of ongoing and another project that was fitting in in the morning, but like every project just got bad at the same time and everyone needed something in two hours. And I'm like, right. ah, How do you do this? I can't be three people at once. This is so stressful. And my computer was messing up too on top of that. So at that point, did you, did you at any point during project 200 K outsource work or is it all just you? I actually outsourced very little. I, I was ready to, yeah. Um, but, yeah, I just ended up not having the projects that made sense. Yeah. And those, those, those could have, some of that could have been outsourced if I had thought about it ahead of time. It was so much of just like a today sucks and I'm just going to have to eat it. Right. 
And then I was like, oh, now tomorrow also sucks. And oh, now the next day. And so there was no, I, I couldn't prepare for that. I just should have, well, I won't even say I should have like not said yes to that many projects because I was like, I'm, I want to push the envelope and see if that's, if I'm comfortable with that. Yeah. And I found the line, I yeah. went over it and I came back. <laughs> uh, and so it took a little time to, to like, I don't know, be okay again, Yeah, but not too long. I think I bounced. I, I am where I am usually. Um, I talk about this with my wife and actually before we were interviewing, you we were like, what do you think about nomading life? Yeah. I kind of am where I am. And so we were in San Diego for the last month, uh, house sitting, and that felt like home. My wife and I were there. We were having a great time and it felt like home. And so like wherever I am, I am. But so if I'm in a bad project, that's, that's where, where I am. Are. That's, that is my new home and it was terrible. <laughs> that's, that's hard to get out of. Yeah. So when that, that suck finally did, uh, pass and you kind of mm -hmm. got back to a normal work schedule, more or less. I mean, if you're pushing that hard, there's I'm assuming nothing is normal. Yeah, but a more manageable workflow, we'll say. Uh, did you have enough energy and reserve that you're able to get kind of get back into it, or did that set the tone for the rest of the project, rest of the year? Oh, uh, I mean, for the rest of the year, I I bounce back pretty quickly. Yeah, okay. Yeah, as okay. soon as I'm in a new situation, which was then better client projects, less stress. Well, I think one of the bigger stresses too was one of those projects was the first or second time I had worked with a new studio. Yeah. And I thought I had screwed everything up. And I messaged the creative director. I'm like, hey man, I'm so sorry. I was having so many computer issues and like, sorry for the late nights. And he was like, dude, you're like one of my top freelancers. I would recommend <laughs> you to anybody. And I was like, what? I thought I screwed up so bad. But I think he saw in me a, a willingness to stick stick it out and fix things that were broken. Yeah. Even if like some of them weren't my fault, some of them were. And, but I did not give up and I spent two nights staying up till 5 a.m. That's not a normal thing. And I don't recommend that to anyone. <laughs> like you need to advocate for your own sanity. Um, but because of the nature of this has to get done, I showed them that I was willing to put in what it took. And so on the projects that, that had to get done, I mean, when you're pushing yourself like that, do they have budgets that you're like, yes, this is worth the suck. Okay. These were. So it wasn't like, okay, I've got to take these, these $2,500 projects on to make this thing happen. No. Yeah. They were not $2,500 pro <laughs> projects, but uh, yeah, they were much higher okay. budgets. Good. Yeah. Good. Um, I want to ask a little bit about the quality control because I've talked to different studio owners here and there and stuff that have made the comment of, you know, if you're moonlighting, if you're taking multiple projects, you're stacking things, we can tell. We, you know, so on and so forth. So through that process, how did you ensure that what you're delivering to client A, client B, and client C, or however many you're stacked at one time, was what they're expecting? That's a good question. Um, I think at that point, well, there were so many factors that went wrong all at the same time. Yeah. And I, I pretty much don't do that anymore <laughs> because I could see it in myself that like this isn't working and I'm not, I'm surely not doing my best work. It right. was good. And I'm, some of the work that I was doing was kind of, the stuff that I could do in my sleep. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I'm a big fan of put yourself in the best situation to do the best work that you can, but also know that not all projects need to be the best work you've ever done. Like do your best in any given moment, but that your best is going to be different day to day. Yeah. You're going to have a headache for a week straight sometime and your work just won't be what you want it to be. It's yeah. Something and so get it done. Yeah. So put, putting yourself in a situation where you can do your best work is a great way to do it. And if you are in a place where, like for me, sometimes I will get booked and another studio that, or maybe more like a video agency says, Hey, can we book you? And I'm like, well, I'm already booked, but I do have some time in the morning that I could give you yeah. maybe two or three hours. Yeah. And like to me, that's not the craziest thing. Um, and it's not going to, it's not a permanent situation, but doing 11 or 12 hours for a week straight. It's not so bad. It's not going to, I don't think that's going to reduce the quality of my work. It's exciting and I'm in it. And so. But yes, if you do that on a consistent basis and you can't handle the workload, you're probably cutting hours to mash it all in. Yep. And that's where the quality will like decrease. Suffer and, everything else. And then it's that that deals that messes up your reputation. And your reputation is huge. <laughs> like that's everything. Then again, we're back to two hundred K at what cost? Right, exactly. Because you can't repeat it again next year because no one wants to work with you anymore. That's not good. Spoiler alert, I did it two years in a row. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there. Yeah. We'll get there. Uh, so at that point, were the clients you're working with, were they aware that you're doing multiple projects? How was that communication stream? Um, yeah, most clients either knew that I was 
or if I, I, I never really double booked in a full double book yeah. scenario where I'm like, I'm working for you all day. I'm working for you all day. Yeah. It was almost always like, I'm giving somebody my, like my eight hours and somebody else that's like, okay, like they need support and I can do that. Got it. And Got so it. I'm just doing their stuff. stuff. It's more moonlighting. Um, Got it. But I think it's good to be good, a uh, good communicator. And so like when I was doing that, I was, I was dedicating those eight hours of work to the studio that I was fully booked with to be like, I'm working for you. I am communicating with you on the spot. Yeah. Um, I'm not like being doing sleazy, yeah. being behind the scenes. I'm going to hide this stuff around here. So, yep. so forth and so forth. Cool. Cool. I was, I was, yeah. on a, I was always kind of curious about how that worked when you're stacking multiple projects like that. It's like, how do you pull that off in a way that everyone's happy and still people are, aren't leery about, are these, is he, if he's doing this much, is he really giving us all the time that, that we, I was right. just kind of curious about that. Yeah. And there's, there are some clients that I have that are more like, Hey, would you be interested in like cutting a promo for me, putting some graphics in it? Yeah. We need it in a couple of months. And that's not a booking. It's more like a project that, that there's a decent amount of time and I can fill, fill gaps yeah. with. And so, yeah, that's not <laughs> something you need to disclose. Like, Hey, I've got an ongoing project that I put in a few hours a week. Right. Right. You're that's just, like, just your own here's your deliverable. Time. I'll yeah. give it to you by, by Wednesday next week, whatever it is. Yeah. That makes so sense. having different kinds of clients can help you fill those gaps. One of the ways I think about it is that whole analogy where, a, a, you know, a teacher up front of the big jar puts in all these big rocks and he's like, is the jar full? And like, yeah. Okay. And then you pour sand. And it's like, is it full now? Yeah. yeah. And then you just keep filling in the gaps. And so if you have those different kinds of clients and different projects that you're working on, it can help you fill gaps so that you're not like one big project. And then it's like four weeks later, you start a new project. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I think that's such a much cleaner, better picture I have in my mentally now. Thank you for, for explaining it that way. Um, so the year goes on. You hit 200K before the end of the year and went over your goal mm -hmm. at that point. Uh, how much did you go over by? Not much. 6,000. 6,000? Um, I think the project that I was on just kept going. Gotcha. And so I, I hit my 200K point, but I'm not going to just like, <laughs> you want to keep that relationship good? Absolutely. And so I, I figured that if I hit the goal, I wasn't going to hit it on the money. Um, I would probably go, go over. over a little bit. A little yeah, bit. it was basically just, yeah, finishing up that. But that, that was project. in December, then that the finish Yeah, happened. middle of December. So then at what point were you like, huh, I did it. Let's do it again. Pretty quick. Yeah? Yeah. But I, to me, I, I gave myself some time, like, over that Christmas break time to, yeah, make a decision on what is my new goal. Yeah. And so my new Project 200K version 2 was I want to hit 200K, but I want to take three months off. And so, yes, technically I hit 200K the next year, and I took two months off intentionally. The first year I took one month off intention un unintentionally, actually more than one month unintentionally. Okay. But I was working. I was like doing all the networking and outreach and building my systems and yeah. making sure that I had a, a system that was going to work. So my time off was not, I, I had time off at the last week and a half or two weeks of the year. Okay. So this, okay. this time I was like, once I started working the first year, sorry, I'm, I'm jumbling some things. You're good. You're good. Uh, year one of project 200 K. Once I started working, I didn't stop. I didn't take a vacation. I did move across the country twice. Which is not easy. During working on projects, my wife is uh, a beast. <laughs> she packed us up and got us moved. And I was literally working in an empty office with a table and my laptop <laughs> while she's packing stuff up. And I hated that I wasn't available to help do right, that. But right. she knew what I was doing. and She believed in the cause. Yeah. yeah. And so that was kind of one of those things. Like She was willing to pick up slack that I was dropping <laughs> because to, to make it on. work. So it's have a supportive uh, system, you know, people in your life that can support you in your endeavors. That's helpful. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the, the second year I was like, okay, I want to actually take time off. I want to go on vacation. It's not all about the money. Like I want to have time. I, some people are like, what is it next year? 300K? And I considered it, but I was like, no, I think I want to like pull back, like maybe find some higher budget projects that are longer term. Yeah. And then be able to take more time off. So I took two months off, went to Bali for vacation, nice. which is on our bucket list since nice. my wife and I had started dating. Um, and I even jokingly said when we were in Bali, so this is in, in Indonesia, and um, the the movie, R -R. It, Eat, Pray, Love. Oh, mind. Yep. oh yeah. No, yep. <laughs> Eat, Pray, Love. Uh, Julie Roberts plays Elizabeth Gilbert, and she goes to 
Bali and that's like a big thing. Yep. And I, while we were in Bali, I was like, I bet you there's so many American tourists here because of that movie. <laughs> and then I was like, when did we decide that we want to go to Bali? That was around. Oh no. <laughs> right after we watched the movie. I am the thing I'm like j- laughing at. <laughs> <laughs> you either die of the hero or stay alive long enough yeah. to the villain. <laughs> exactly. But even back then, this is like, we were not making hardly any money. I think I had like, I was making $32,000. So literally when I would find extra change, we had a buck, a bucket or a jar. We'd put the uh, money in the jar and we'd say Bali. That was going towards our Bali fund. And now, um, that's a really interesting insight to go from 30,000 a year. Like it's where you're like, I'm going to save every penny we can to pull this, this bucket on the side of the off to be in like, I'm going to double down and we're going to do, 400k in two years yeah besides just the the financial freedom that that gives you or the or the change in life so that that can allow you talk about just the emotional um journey of of that mindset shift yeah oh man it i i i know that people say mindset is everything yeah and it sucks that it doesn't make sense until it clicks until your mindset changes and then you're like oh yeah it is mindset is huge and knowing like going from someone who like was afraid to reach out to studios because year one of my, me going freelance, I worked with a studio twice. And on the second project, I screwed up. I overcommitted. I said I could do it, but I was so green in the industry that I didn't know what I could do. Yeah. I was like, I just have to like, I'll stay up late and I'll, I'll I'll get it it done. And the day before it was due, I was like, Hey guys, I don't know. I'm behind and I thought I could finish last night, but I'm totally not even close. And they were like, dude, we hired you because we don't have time to do this. It's a small project. And like, I, they kind of said, I could read between the lines, like you screwed up, man. And, uh, I was like, I need to not ever reach out to studios until I get my shit together on my end. So I only reached out to direct clients that don't know anything about motion design. And I was playing it safe because I was so embarrassed. There was like a lot of shame in that, like, Um, feeling like I screwed up and I don't want to show my face in the industry again. Absolutely. And so I went quiet for a long time um, because I was, yeah, I was ashamed. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and so I just kind of felt like I wasn't worth much monetarily, let's say like from an income standpoint, I wasn't worth charging a lot for a while, which I mean, there's some reality of like when you're green, you're fresh, you're new, like you're not going to be charging a lot. And so it took a long time for me to, I was like, one day I'll probably figure out how to make good money. And so even the teaching was part of me figuring out how to make money. I'm a a half entrepreneur, half artist or hundred percent entrepreneur, hundred percent artist. Yeah. (laughs) Just depends on the day of how much I'm leaning into one or the other. And so I believed one day it would happen, but it was hard to make the decision. Like, no, today is the day. This is the year that I actually make something happen. Talk about that, that decision right there. Um, What was the deciding factor and how did you start taking action? Um, so two years in a row, I made the decision that I wanted to make 250 K before I decided to make 200 K. Yep. Yep. And I got nowhere close. (laughs) (laughs) And part of that was like setting the goal, but not really having a way or a path to get there. Yeah. So I thought, oh, I'll just sell more courses, but I didn't really have a path to do that. I don't know how to do that. And I kept ping ponging between, well, this course didn't make enough money for me to just do this full time. I got to go back to freelance. And while I was freelancing, I didn't have time to market the thing. And so I kept finding myself not getting traction on anything. So I was like, it just, I, I believe in myself, but it's just, it always just felt like a not yet, not yet, not yet. Yeah. And I, I remember hearing somebody say like one of the biggest mistakes entrepreneurs make is they find out how to make money and then they get excited about a new thing and never do the thing that, that they, they they don't keep repeating the thing that makes money and that was my first business <laughs> <Go on. laughs> yeah um i love what adam pluff says about business and like the way he thinks about um battle axe his company so he was like i want my business to make like to be profitable early so that i can invest the money into building the company and the brand that i want to make i think of myself as an artist as a as a band yeah And the band needs the tour to make the money to make the next album. Absolutely. And so you need the money to make the things that you want to make in the world. And so while I'm excited about making more money, it's not just about the money. It's like, what can I do next? And what's, um, what's on the horizon for that? Yeah. Um, going back to the, making this, the decision was, okay, I figured out a way to make money with freelance, but I haven't really leaned into that and given that the full commitment. And so that's, it was a very hard decision because 
talking about uh, committing to something and then being like, no. Yep, yep. The December before I decided to make 200K, I had like done this whole promo of launching. I had a full Harbor membership. It was a motion design community. And I had launched this huge bundle. Like you can buy it for $1,000. You get a, a year long membership and you're going to get access to any course that I make during the year and this, that, and the other. And I, I was so excited. I launched it. Um, one person bought, but it wasn't getting any kind of traction. Yeah. And I just had that like, oh, I feeling. failed again. Oh. <laughs> and I was so embarrassed. I gave the guy his money back, pulled out all of my promos from Instagram and was like pretty devastated for the month of December. I did not know what I was going to do. And I, I told my wife, I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to quit all of this teaching stuff. I don't think that I'm ready to make a full shift into that. And yeah, that was when I was like, yeah, I, I'm going to lean into the thing I know. And just freelance. Yeah. With, with freelance. And I'm going to do what it takes to figure out how to bring more income in through that. And I was like, from the entrepreneurial side, I've always heard people say like the more laser focused you can be, the ha the higher impact you can have. Yeah. It's hard to attack the door of the, the gate that you need to get past yeah. from a tiny, a bunch of tiny little rocks. But if you have one strong arrow that you have all your emphasis and focus on, that can like crack the door. Yeah, when you're when your focus and attention is divided too many ways, you can't you can't really double down and bet on yourself. And it doesn't mean you can't never do double negative. That you can't <laughs> never do multiple things, but without focus, you can't build a thing long like good long enough term. to have momentum, which is everything. Yeah, and so that was the most freeing thing that I had probably ever done was to decide to stop doing the things that I had been putting so much energy into for the last three or four years, thinking that was my path and saying, no, that's not my path right now. I'm going to focus on freelance. That can't be it. That could not have been an easy decision to come to terms with. And to tell my wife that like, you know, those three years we've been spending four <laughs> years building this thing, I'm going to just stop. <laughs> she, and she, it, it wasn't a hard sell for her. I thought it was going to be a lot harder sell yeah. to, for her to be like, yeah, just go for it. That's awesome. <laughs> but she said, Sounds like a keeper. do you believe that you can double your income? That's what I was kind of saying. I think I could double my income question mark. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, I mean, if you believe in it, let's go for it. And I'll back you up on that. Support system is everything. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I love that. So you hit project 200K, you start project 200K off. It works. It takes off. You make it. You decide to do it again. You do it and you take two months of time off. Um, talk about how looking back that decision to, to double down on freelance and to chase this, how has it changed your life on just a day, day by day basis? Um, even though we had made upwards of a hundred K, uh, we were always in a really bad cash flow uh, scenario. Yeah. So the money would come in right before we needed it for taxes and like we were behind on taxes. So we needed that extra cash. So none, every time we like made good money, it was always going to something else. Yep. We had never, we were just like, oh, I, I can't I, I relate. sinking down. You get a big paycheck coming in and oh no, we've got the engine of the car just died. Yes. Ugh. And so that was our financial life. Now we had like gotten out of debt. So that felt good. Um, that was also another just big financial decision where we were like, okay, let's get out of debt as fast as we can. So we don't have that weighing us down, yeah. but we also don't have kids and we don't have a house. So it's no Your no shame on different. no shame on anybody who has debts um but for us that was something we didn't want yeah but it still it didn't mean we were like financially free right it was still very stressful and we kept hitting like oh we're getting really dangerously low on that bank account and so the day-to-day -day difference is when you have three to five months of business money not just like personal spending money yeah this is like money that's going to go into all of your expenses with business um taxes or there's a separate account for taxes and that's sitting there. I'm not worried about taxes. Um, if no business comes in for months and months and months, we'll be fine. Um, that kind of, and our, our actual goal right now is to build up to a, a full year of business backup money. That's cool. Um, that's cool. Which was hard to do in New York city, <laughs> uh, but it was, it was kind of wild to be like making living in Manhattan and saving money. I never thought that was going to happen in my life. I thought New York would just be a decision like, we just run out of money and then we leave. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm curious about the choice to move to New York. Was that for 
uh, the sake of we can be in person and hit these studios and, and work in person. It was just just personal decision. Yeah, I've always wanted to live there for like a year or two. Yeah, I got that idea from my uncle because he loves food. And yeah. So he loves traveling to New York. And he was like, oh, if I could just live there for a year or two, I could like try out all the restaurants, <laughs> <laughs> which is not true. I, I did the math. And if you wanted to eat at every restaurant in Manhattan, it would take you 42 years eating at no restaurant twice life goals <laughs> <laughs> and by then like half of the restaurants have gone out of business so right it's, <laughs> it's a circulating problem <laughs> so but since since then you guys have actually become uh, more or less digital nomads where you spent time at was south carolina north carolina north carolina now you're in, in california right now eventually planning on being in arizona talk to me about that digital that nomad life yeah uh that actually came early when i first got my got my first job in 2008 as a graphic designer, read Four Hour Work Week and Vagabonding. Those two books shaped me into someone who wanted to see the world and make money on the internet. Yeah. Uh, those that it took me 10 or 12 years to ever sell a digital product. Um, but my wife and I both like traveling. So, uh, Digital Nomad was a very enticing idea. I hated being tied down to the office. And so, yeah, just that the freedom to like go see other things and move about has yeah, been ingrained in me for a long time. I love it. I love it. Uh, is that a long-term plan? You guys are planning on traveling long-term or is there an end goal in sight? It's always up in the air. Um, when we move back to Phoenix, it'll likely be a, like we're moving there, but we also don't like being there in the summer. So we're, we're, gonna we're trying to, house summer house. I don't think we'll have different houses, but we do want to like go different places. Okay. So maybe spend, a month or two somewhere not as hot, yep. which is pretty easy yep. to do when you're in Phoenix. <laughs> Anywhere else pretty much is not as hot. <laughs> I would say come visit me in South Dakota, but it's just as hot there too. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> so yeah, that's, it's, everything's always up in the air and we like dreaming and planning about where we want to be and what we want to be doing. For sure. For sure. So now that 200 Project Generate K has wrapped, uh, are you planning on doing it again? Or at this point it's more like we just want to live a sustainable life. That's a good question. I'm definitely in another transition year Yeah, where I'm uh, starting to coach more, mm -hmm. which means I turned down more freelance work. So I was like kind of holding on to the 200 K idea yeah. and coaching, like adding it. Yeah. And I realized like if I'm doing my course, it's really hard to focus on my students goes and back to that laser focus thing. Yeah. And so I've, I felt myself slipping in the laser focus area because you cannot, you can't just maintain freelance and spend uh, another full-time job coaching. <laughs> right, 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 right. Um, it's not like a business that uh, has any element of, you know, you can get systems and you can be more efficient. Yeah. But it definitely takes a lot of your time. Yeah. And so. So in, in my, my back, back history, uh, I worked alongside some people that in their in industry were, were literally the world records of, of what they do. And so the first years that they, they pushed hard and they broke the records, they broke the goals. They just built that, that name for themselves. And then they decided, you know, that was really expensive and that was really hard. And we didn't really <laughs> make money doing it or just your time or burnout or emotional, whatever insert adjective you want to use here. So the, the goal was to find what is that happy balance between a good living wage, something sustainable, and still freedom. Yeah. What, is, what do you think it looks like for you? I'm definitely not driven to be the best of anything. Um, I like the idea of it and I get inspired by people. Or like LeBron James, you know, I, I saw actually him talking on some interview recorded a while ago, obviously, um, where he said, uh, some people play because they can't lose. Some people play because they have to win. Yep. And I think both of those are flawed because he's like, I play to learn every single time. I want to learn how to be better every time I play. He was like, if you have fear of losing, that's your motivation, then that's going to like drive you crazy. Right. If you have to win then anytime you lose, you're devastated, you're but you can always learn. And every time you learn, you get better. And that's, he's like in the middle, I think that's the, the, the powerful place to be. And so I, I aim to live a life where I'm always learning and always pushing myself, but a little bit less about pushing my own boundaries in, in the yeah. same direction every time. So I don't, yeah. I don't, my drive is not to like make 200 K with four, three months off and then four months off. It's just, there, there may be new challenges that I want to give myself. I love that. Um, right now it's just I want to build a program that helps freelancers increase their income in yeah. a provable like systematic way. Yeah. And even even within this year 
I've gone from, I feel like I can create that program and then let it run and do another thing to, I think this might be my baby that I keep nurturing for a long period of time. And it's not something that I can just like push off into the world and it just works. Yeah. I think there's so much uh, personal connection that is made and like improvements in ways that you run the program. And uh, the program that I'm running is shifting and changing every single session. So I'm like, man, I, I think this is going to be a, a long-term project that I'm working on that just will morph. And I'm sure it will be unrecognizable in five years. And that's cool. I love that. Oh, I love that so much. Uh, so with that coaching program, let's, let's talk a little bit more about that. Um, what is someone is interested in joining kind of, what is the expectation? What do you outline for them? Give me kind of a high level overview. Yeah. So, uh, my ideal person for this, like I teach my, 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 I'm, I hate saying student because that feels like young. Master and old. Yeah. yeah. So like my coaching clients, the, the, the freelancers that I'm coaching, I get them to think about like, what is their ideal client? And so my ideal client getting yeah. meta on that is yeah. freelancers that have been doing this for like a year who are making around 30 K that just shows that like they can work with clients, get paid. Um, this is not necessarily a, you've never freelanced before and you want to slide in and figure that out. I may at some point develop this something that's one class. Yeah. This is the 201 <laughs> class. This is the take you from 50% of your potential to 60 or 70. Uh, I think anybody could like still improve afterwards, yeah. but it's not a beginner course. Okay. Okay. Um, so, but the, my thing is I have a checklist that gives people something to do every day, week and month. Um, they have six weeks of training that gets them basically the foundation of my like freelance system. Yeah. Um, that's a lot of learning and a lot of iterating and changing something, thinking about things a new way. We have lots of clarity calls and co-working sessions. Very hands-on. So it's very, very, it's very hands-on. So six weeks of intense training and then another, like the rest of the year since my, well, the program's called Plus 25K at the moment. Yep. And the idea is that I'll help them make an extra $25,000 yep. more than they made the 12 months prior. Perfect. And so I have them in the program, even though it's more of like an alumni part after they graduate from the, the main training, I think of the year as like circular. So for the rest of the year, they have support to like keep improving on their system. Yeah. Um, staying consistent throughout the year rather than just like you're trained and now go off. off. You go up out of one. They go off and then they're like, oh, this is a neat system. And then they try something new and they don't stick with something long enough for it to work. So that's, that's kind of why I, I want it to be a year long program, even though they don't need to be like trained for longer than that. Right, right, right. You want to dive into like the high level topics that you kind of teach, kind of walk yeah. through? Yeah. Um, finding your, figuring out some form of an ideal client. Most people have somewhat of that dialed in. Um, it doesn't have to be specific to make that extra 25 K. Okay. Uh, but building a list of studios okay. that you could work at, or if you're not going the studio route, potential clients, yep. um, building a CRM. Um, doing outreach, kind of the freelance manifesto style stuff, like yep. finding the person to do the email yep. with, um, then uh, building your online presence. Does like you found your ideal client? Uh, does your presence in all facets say that you are the right person for the job? That's social media. That's your email signature. That's your website. Do your links getting the polish match. out there? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and then. We're in an interview, so of course my mind is blinking. <laughs> the best part about this is we have the Hollywood magic of editing. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, then then it really gets into a lot of the like finessing your email outreach and getting consistent with posting content that makes sense for both peers and potential clients yeah. on I'm focusing on LinkedIn right now. It's like just it's the place Which is to where be. I first stumbled across you. Exactly. Makes sense. Yeah. Yep. And one of the big mindset shifts that I see a lot of my coaching clients make is they feel like there's already enough voices out there. But the biggest, the biggest thing that I think is a big mind mind shift. Yeah, man, a mindset block is that like we were talking actually before the interview that there's, there are so many little pockets. You can feel like, you know, everybody in your pocket, that pocket yeah. is such a small pocket in the world. Yeah. The world absolutely. is so freaking big. And so if you're like, well, in my little pocket of all the motion designers I follow, there's already enough people talking about this. The, the world is so <laughs> freaking big. There's so many people 
that you could potentially work with, even within your own state, you, there's more than you probably realize yeah. by a long shot. And well, so just to, just to kind of give my own personal spin on that, yeah. like, again, we're here at Camp, Mo, Camp MoGraph. I walk around, I'm talking to everybody, and I think there's 170 people here this year. Yeah. And I think by this point, I've met at least 150 of them. I'm like, yeah. We're on a first name basis. It's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. But then you take that to another small conference like Dash Bash, which is like two or 300, I believe. And I'm like, I don't know anybody. And it's the same motion design industry. Yeah. And well, that's not even our client base and, yet. And, and then for me at Dash Bash, I felt like I knew two thirds of the people there. And I came out here and I'm like, wow, there's so many new faces I've never seen. And they all know each other. I'm like, how am I out of the loop as much as this? And we're in I the thought. same circle. And so I'm learning my, like t taking my own medicine that, yeah, their, their obscurity is probably your problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, <Yep. laughs> and putting yourself out there is not like, I, th I don't know why it is specifically. This is something that like I got over, let's call it a long time ago because yeah. I just started posting and writing blog posts in 2014. So I'm like, I'm very much used to creating content, connecting with people on social media. But a lot of people are like, I just don't like social media. And I'm like, that's fine. You don't have to like it as a form of entertainment, but, but like it is a tool. You have a business and if you want if you want it bad enough, this is a great tool to distribute yourself to other people out there in the world. <laughs> um and sure that's not going to be for everybody, but I think it's a, a really powerful way to to get connected in the world and the Every door of opportunity is opened by another person. And if you're not getting to know other people, you could send all the outreach, but if you're not actually connecting with people and, and building relationships. And that in-person handshake is the most valuable thing you can have. Yeah. Totally agree. Totally agree. Uh, so if somebody is interested in making an extra $25,000 next year as a freelancer, how do they do that? Uh, right now, the best way to do that is contact me through LinkedIn or email. Um, I'm Austin Sailor. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to spell your last uh, name real quick? S A Y L O R. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. I don't have like a a page. I'm just taking ten students at a time, and I've got a a big email list. So I've I've got a lot of people that I'm just able to say, "Hey, are you interested?" Yeah. And I'm filling a class. Um, but I know that I want to. At some point, I need to branch out of my own my own little bubble, and um, start marketing my own program better. But I'm in a very much a building and uh, refining this this program right now stage. I love it. And so I don't need or want a ton of students i i think my favorite part about it is, is, is you're out there just a you gave back and are giving back to the community through your project 200k you're sharing information you're curating uh, a lot of information that's out there to help people learn this stuff and then you're giving back to those that are interested in, in learning on it too i think that's just really cool so yeah thank you for all of that i appreciate it oh thanks Jason. awesome and austin thanks so much for being on frame one i appreciate it yeah if anyone is watching this and has not liked and subscribed yet What's wrong with you? Please do so. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks again for watching.